preacher mentioned about quitting, and every time somebody mentions about quitting, you know, I think as far as we're concerned, uh, quit and do what? You know, Amen. I don't know anything I'd rather be doing than, than uh, being a missionary. And uh, this morning, uh, it's one of the songs we sang before the Sunday school hour, this never, uh, never, never look back. It reminded me of the illustration I heard and used not uh, too many too long ago about Winston Churchill. You know, Winston Churchill was uh, uh, quite a fellow, probably the best known uh, Englishman in this century. And uh, remember the story that I read, and I actually read it, read it in a message, a printed message of how uh, he stood, you know, at the time of uh, England's darkest day, the, when Germany was just completely devastating the country and the U2s were coming in and he was always the, he was the symbol of resistance, of, you know, stand and uh, keep on, you know, and at a very low time is when he came to the forefront and went all the way through the Second World War and uh, became, as I say, probably the English statesman of the century. But uh, he was uh, invited a number of times to his uh, alma mater, this university he graduated from, to be the commencement speaker, and he always had rejected it, and finally he agreed to come and uh, speak uh, to the graduating class of his university that he graduated from, and actually, uh, as in most places, I was just at one not too long from over this last week, I've been a couple of pre-graduations lately, and uh, there's a lot of things, a lot of people want to say things, and and a lot of, do a lot of things, and usually the last thing is for the fellow to stand up and speak. And uh, it was in this case, naturally there were thousands in this great auditorium that came to hear Winston Churchill, not necessarily to see the people graduate. And uh, so I read it, the place was packed out, all these people waiting, and they'd gone through all those formalities, and finally it came to his turn. He stood up and he said, never, 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 never turn back and sit down. <laughs> that's all he said. And uh, that's all he needed to say. Right. Because all of his life, all that he'd stood for, his example of the Second World War and all the rest, that's all he had to say. And I'm sure that uh, no one in that university, graduation speaker, probably is remembered for his message as much as that message of seven words that uh, Winston Churchill gave. And I was thinking of that in Sunday school class, but I don't remember the song, song we sang. Uh, but, you know, really, that's exactly what God wants us to do as far as his work. We really it is. I mean, we need that kind of a commitment. Just, you know, never, 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 never turn back. Uh, that's what it's going to take. And uh, this idea of quitting, that brought back once again to my memory, so I thought, and that's not my message. Uh, that's just um, something extra. I just thought of right there. Us now, but uh, we do need on the mission field in the United States of America in Lancaster, Ohio. Uh, that's what we need right. are people who know the Lord and will just not turn back, never, 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 never turn back as far as their service to the Lord. Uh, that's what it's going to take, and uh, we're glad that uh, God's been able, to, God's given us the, the opportunity to help and strengthen or whatever it was, we've had to stay in that place and uh, see some good results. You know, a lot of times in the Lord's service, people quit just before the good results. Right. Just before. I mean, they go right up there, they stand, and, they, and then just when they're going to be able to really see the blessing, they quit. <laughs> and uh, for, for the rest of their life, uh, it's many times defeated. <coughs> they didn't hold on just a little longer. God's called it. Acts chapter 26 this morning. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad that uh, God's given us the privilege to travel around the United States, visit our supporting churches. It's a joy to be able to meet some of the folks that are giving and praying that the gospel might go around the world. Acts chapter 26 beginning in verse 15 through 18. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast 
seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Verse 19 also. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Just that far. Uh, the situation when these words were spoken is a very interesting situation. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, want to talk about nations, probably uh, number one as far as a missionary. Right. Uh, there at not the very close of his ministry, but almost the close of his ministry, many years of serving the Lord behind, brought before this king and all the important people of the city of Caesarea, and given the opportunity to speak, and rather than deliver a tremendous defense of his innocence, because you see he was a prisoner at this time, he stands, and if you read the whole 26th chapter of Acts, you'll find out, he did really nothing more than just give his personal testimony right. of how he was saved. Now, that, that ought to mean something to you and I. Many of God's people today, when you ask them to do something, they say, well, but brother, I don't know how to do that. I don't have the experience. I don't have the, the study, the education necessary to do that or, or some other thing they'll use for not serving the Lord and not witnessing for the Lord. But you know the greatest message that any man has, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest is to be able to tell him how you came to know the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ to save us. I, I just don't know anything. Uh, yeah, the, might be the most theological, uh, exact, and the most homiletical, perfect message uh, that can be preached. But the best message, really, uh, that we can that we can tell anybody about and give to anyone is our own personal testimony how we came to know the Lord Jesus. I think that's that's what's shown right here. Amen. You know, Paul didn't have any problem with words. Now, I sometimes have problems with words. Uh, I'm getting out of that. I've been back in the States for, for three months, and so I've sort of gotten the Portuguese out there and my English back in, you know. And every now and then I have to ask my translator that I bring along with my wife what I'm, what I'm trying to say so I can say it in English. But uh, I'm getting that. But you know, the... Uh, the situation is that uh, our greatest message is our personal testimony. And uh, you see it here. Paul had the ability to speak. He could have the ability to defend himself and his innocence. And he was innocent. He didn't deserve the, the, the chains that he was chained with at this particular time. And he could have done that. And he, as I said, he wouldn't have had any problem with with being able to impress those people with his education, with his knowledge, and with his defense, because that was what he was trained in. But he stood and stands, and he gives his personal testimony. He tells them about how he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. He tells them about uh, what Christ told him, and uh, then he applies that, and he challenges those, uh, the king in particular, uh, with that testimony that he gave. And I want to use just a few things, because we just have just a few minutes here. Uh, and some of you folks say, well, I've got 35 minutes, uh, 25 minutes. Uh, that's just a few minutes, folks. I mean, down where I'm from, uh, you don't preach in 30 minutes. I mean, unless you uh, are sick or something. Uh, I mean, you know, we just we just have longer messages down there, and I'm used to preaching long. Uh, but I, I've, got, I've gotten everything straight. I mean, the preacher tells me when to quit, I quit. And uh, I've learned a long time ago to do what the preachers tell me to do when I'm visiting their churches. Otherwise, don't invite me back. So, uh, so uh, it's a personal thing. But, uh, you know, uh, this thing, this testimony we have here of the Apostle Paul, I'd like to use as a basis in the few minutes we had here this morning uh, to sort of relate some personal testimony of my own in relationship in the same direction, using it as a basis, this testimony of the Apostle Paul before these people in that day. First of all, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest, the first verse that we read uh, this morning. You know, that's a great statement. Right. Uh, when you realize the situation
situation there, you know, the situation, who it was. Here was a fellow that was on his way to Damascus, on his way to another city, and his motive, his desire, the reason he was going there was to do in as many of God's people as he could. Throw them in prison and kill them if necessary. Uh, you know, he was there when uh, Stephen was stoned. He was the one who uh, promoted that whole thing and brought Stephen, humanly speaking, to his death uh, there that day. That's the first mention we have of, of Paul, then at that time called Saul. And he was on. He was out at that particular time to destroy, if possible, to erase from the face of the earth, if possible, the very name of Jesus. And so you can sort of imagine uh, there as he laid there in the, the dirt of the road to Damascus. And uh, he said, who are you? And Jesus said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now that meant something to him. That was a shock, I'm sure. And you don't, you notice that in his testimony, if you turn back to the first part of the book of Acts, and when it actually relates his testimony of his conversion, you'll find that Paul did not argue with the Lord. He didn't try to doubt who he was. He didn't no, he just accepted uh, what he heard because I really personally believe that the testimony of Stephen and surely also the testimony of others that we don't have recorded here in the book of Acts that witnessed to Paul before he was saved, I'm sure those words and that message, uh, the seed of the word of God and the seed of the gospel was planted in that man's heart. Right. And as he was there on the road and he heard Jesus say, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Uh, there wasn't any possibility for argument. There wasn't any desire for argument. That's all the Lord had to say right. to Paul that day. And, uh, you know, in this world, of, well, with all of our knowledge, with all of our progress, and my, I'll tell you, uh, you've made progress. Uh, we've made progress in this world in, in my generation. Uh, I don't probably hear things have changed uh, gradually, but when you go to a outside of the United States and you're gone for a few years and you come back and you see a lot of things that you don't realize, uh, you know, how far things have come. And uh, I'll tell you, there's a lot of things about uh, the United States that I enjoy. You probably don't enjoy uh, the freeways uh, here. I enjoy freeways. I enjoy streets without big, huge potholes in where you actually literally blow out tires because the holes so deep. Make big dents in your rim, you have to go home with a sledgehammer and bang them back out before you get the tire fixed. Uh, you know, a lot of things that uh, you have here you don't, we don't have down there. God's given us a lot of things. Uh, but you know, uh, one thing about, one thing that hasn't changed, and that is uh, the need of Jesus Christ in the heart of man. And uh, as I think of these words here, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Oh, that the people out there, and maybe even right here in this church today, that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior, as their Savior, have not had a personal contact, a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and have asked Him to come into their heart and into their lives and save them from their sin. Uh, my, I'll tell you, you haven't had that experience. Uh, you miss the whole reason for life when you come right down to it. By Jesus whom thou persecutest. That's what Jesus said to him when he asked him, Who art thou? And then you'll notice in verse 16, as I say, no argument, no doubts. Jesus continues. He and Paul's repeating the words of Jesus here. Jesus said to him, But rise and stand upon thy feet. Uh, humanly speaking, because of what Paul was out to do and what Paul had done and was, was wanting to do, uh, he shouldn't have heard those words, rise and stand. You know, uh, maybe the words more appropriate, just stay right there on your face. Uh, you know, that, well, what you've been doing to him. No, but the Lord had other words for him. Rise and stand upon thy feet. And I sort of like to think of that as being, as being symbolic of what happens when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. You know, I didn't come from a Christian home. My dad was a declared atheist. And my mother was religious but lost. And I can remember as I was growing up hearing the name Jesus Christ, but always a swear word. Never heard it in me either way. When the word God or when somebody brought up the, 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 the a subject of God, I can all I can remember is it being laughed at. Uh, as if, uh, you know, some... 
stupid thing, you know, some dumb thing. Nobody believed that. That's, you know. And that was the situation that I was raised up in. And then at the age of 11 years, my father left. And I loved my father very much. And he left. And I took that as a personal, a, a personal uh, thing. And I just rebelled against that, and I turned against everybody. I went from a very normal childhood to a very mixed-up 11-year-old who hated everybody. And I showed that by rebellion and everything else. And I, from the age of 11 until almost 14, just a few days before I turned 14, I was a mixed up, frustrated little boy, young boy. Thankful, Lord, I came to know Christ as Savior. That's what turned it around. Where in the world I would be today, I have no idea. I can't imagine what would have happened. But the direction that I was going in, from the time my father left until I was saved, that those three years of direction was in a very bad direction. So I thank God for salvation. I thank God that uh, that day in a little church in Nashville, Tennessee, a young fellow of almost 14 heard the gospel message and received Jesus Christ as Savior because then the healing process began. Then I begin to get things straight around and in right perspective that I could have found in no other way except through the gospel. Rise and stand upon thy feet. You know, salvation is the basis of our total life when you come right. down to it. Uh, not all have had the experience I've had. Some of you have been raised in Christian homes. And I don't know what that's like except that we've established a Christian home and raised our children in that thing. But I personally can't remember that in my childhood. But I thank God that I met him just before I turned 14. And even though I was all messed up and I'm going in exactly the opposite direction as far as anything that was going to come good of this life, uh, God saved me. And he told me to rise up and stand. And uh, that firm foundation that I found in the Lord Jesus Christ and is still just as firm today as it was then. Not me, but the foundation upon which I am standing. And I thank God for uh, what God has done for me because, you see, he's done it because I've been on that firm foundation since that age of almost 14. And so many of the things I look back, so many of the blessings of God I realize I have because that day Jesus said to me, rise and stand. And that's the only reason. Uh, that we've been able to because uh, we're standing upon him, the solid rock of salvation. Verse 16 goes on and says, Jesus saying to him, and Paul repeating it that day as he gave his testimony, For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. God saved us for a purpose. Right. Uh, it wasn't just to give us a home called heaven, and he gave us that day that I received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, from that day until this, until I get there, I'm homeward bound. And my home is heaven. There was nothing from then until now that could, could have taken me from that uh, direction and nothing from here until I get there is going to take me from that direction. But that is not the only purpose for which the Lord saved me and saved you. So many, many of God's people have gotten the idea from somewhere, and it's not from the Word of God, that salvation is just a fire escape from hell, that's all. But it's not. God saved you and I for a purpose. And notice, that's what it says here, for this purpose, an exact purpose. And you know, I'm glad he has that exact purpose in my life. Uh, you know, when I was saved, I had no idea. I didn't have any idea about being a missionary about preaching the gospel. I was a member of my church for uh, three years, the church I was saved in, never saw a missionary. The only time I heard anything about missions was Christmas time. I think they called it the Lottie Moon Missionary Offering. That's all I'd ever heard about. I had no idea what, anything about missions. And at the age of 17, the Lord touched my heart and uh, told me he wanted me to do something for him. 
And I told him I, at that time, I said, Lord, I, uh, you know, I, not a verbal com, uh, conversation, but it's almost a verbal conversation. Uh, I said, Lord, you know, I'll be glad to do what you want me to do as long as it's not preaching because you know I can't preach. You know I can't stand up. And I couldn't at that time. I couldn't stand up and preach. No. I couldn't even give my testimony to my Sunday school class, let alone say something in front of the church. I mean, I just couldn't. And so, but I said, but Lord, I'll do what you want me to do, but I know it isn't preaching. And I, even when I first started Bible school, I just knew it wasn't preaching that the Lord was going to do it because I couldn't do it. I remember the first time I had to preach and before my class in Bible school. And uh, I was one of the last ones to preach because I, they knew all, all knew I was scared to death. And I think the teacher had pity on me. She just put my name way back at the end of the list. But it came. The day finally arrived. And I prepared for at least two and a half weeks. Solid preparation. I had enough material to preach at least two hours and a half. And uh, it took me just two and a half minutes to preach the whole message. <laughs> and the, pre the teacher of our class, he said when he got up, you know, usually they he criticized, and I criticized, he, oh, constructive criticism, uh, the mistakes and all the rest, you know, but he all he said was, well, uh, what there was of it was pretty good. And that's all he said. <laughs> uh, they realized, he as well as the other students realized how, just how scared I was and how hard of a time I had doing that thing. Well, now there's no problem. I prepare two and a half minutes and it'll go two and a half hours now. But anyway, uh, God has a purpose in our lives. And I finally heard a missionary while I was Bible school. And uh, he came along, first missionary I'd ever seen, showed some slides, showed a river, a path going up the side of a hill, and a little palm leaf covered house on top of that hill, and he told about a missionary that had gone there and started to work, and his wife got sick and couldn't stay, and they'd come back to the States, and there was nobody to preach the gospel in that place. And I, that's all I remember about what that missionary said. That's all. Just that picture and what he said about it. His message, all the rest, I have no idea what he said. But the Lord caused me to remember that thing. And uh, about three years after that, uh, or maybe even a little earlier, Lord impressed upon my heart through other things that God wanted us to go to the Amazon River about in Brazil and preach the gospel. And I expect it probably was the will of God. You know, after 34 years there, you sort of get the idea that it was the Lord's will, especially when you see all that he uh, helped and all the times that he's been with us and all. But God has a purpose for our lives, a purpose for saving us. And uh, all that we might understand it come to know what that purpose is, and then do it. After being a missionary for 34 years, I thank and praise God that he called me to the land of Brazil. And I'll be frank with you, I could not, if I look back today and see all that God has done through us in the land of Brazil, I marvel for this. Because he didn't have, he didn't have anything to start with. Now my wife's smart. And my wife got the language quickly. I had a terrible I mean, I didn't know anything about English grammar. And then there, the teacher down there tried, was trying to teach me Portuguese grammar, and I didn't, know about, I didn't know much about English grammar. And so I had a terrible time. But uh, it was God's purpose for our lives. And we look back now and see all that God has done through us. And my, it's a blessing to, to see that and realize that God started with nothing. And he's, as he says here in verse 16, Make thee a minister, and we could use that word servant there, and a witness. A servant and a witness. That's what he wants to make us, folks. Right. And, uh, you know, when you're here in the United States and you're in the culture that you were brought up in, and thing, the country you were brought up in, and the language you were brought up in, uh, it's different than when you go to another country. I remember the, the day we left the United States 34 years ago drove to Miami, Florida that was supposed to get to Brazil by car, and I sold my car. Uh, the guy that I sold my car to took me to the back to the airport where my wife and little boy was, and we got on the airplane, and we flew to Brazil. First airplane ride, never forget it. Uh, we got on the plane, and there were all these, they had all a bunch of the seats all stacked up, and a bunch of boxes in almost all the plane. There were only six passengers on the whole plane. And uh, a man and his wife, 
boy, their little boy, a Brazilian, spoke English. Another fellow, and my wife and I and our little boy, that's all the passengers. We're more, pa more crew members than we're passengers on the plane almost. And uh, as I sat there, I see, saw the, this fellow, he'd go up to the cockpit, the one the single fellow, and then the, the pilot would go back with him, go way back in the back of the plane, and sit down back there, out of sight. Pretty soon he'd go back, and the co-pilot would go back up and back, and they would just continue going back and forth. And finally, I thought, what? So I asked this Brazilian fellow sitting right in front of me, and I said, what, what are you? And he said, oh, that man there, the fellow there, he's a whiskey runner. And this is all whiskey in these boxes. <laughs> and uh, they're, well, they're drinking back there. Now, my first airplane ride, I probably arrived in Brazil with a drunken pilot and co-pilot. Tomorrow we'll even make it. But, uh, you know, the, the, the Lord uh, is good. Amen. He's good. If he wants to make us a minister and a witness, a servant and a witness. And when you go to a place and live, I've never been around water in my life. Now, I took baths, but I mean, you know, rivers or lakes. Uh, and I hear we go to the largest river system in the world. Uh, I don't even know how to swim. And here I am, never been in a boat. And here I am living on the river, you know. Yeah, some, some people say, well, do you know how to swim yet? Well, not really. Uh, how in the world can you live on the river like that for years and years and travel so much and not drown? But, well, it's evident you just don't fall in, that's all. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of my good friends said, if you ever fall in, Joe, just go to the bottom and run like everything towards shore. <laughs> well, I haven't had to try that yet. And, uh, I don't really know whether it'll work. But uh, make us into his servants and his witnesses. And God has to do that, so. But you know, God will do that if you allow it. And that's our testimony. Witness for him. If you're to witness, you've got to be able to speak to the people. And down there, that, that was my problem. I, uh, speaking Portuguese, you know, I uh, had a terrible time with it. I was very discouraged. And ended up going on a two-week trip to the interior with a Brazilian young man, a Brazilian young fellow. And got stranded way up in the middle of nowhere, hundreds of miles from home. And I mean stranded among these people. I spent six weeks without hearing a word of English. And when I come back to town, my wife was almost ready to buy a ticket and come back to the States, thought the Indians had got me. And uh, we went to make contact with the Indians. And, uh, but I, they didn't. I just got stranded up there and came back and I could actually think in Portuguese. I mean, for six weeks, everybody wanted to talk to me. And so I had to speak Portuguese. Nobody understood English, so figured, well, that's the way to learn English. And that's when we moved into here. I thought, well, if this is the way I want to get forced, I'll just go in there and uh, speak it out of uh, necessity. You know, nobody else speaks to you except your wife. And you finally get tired of just talking to your wife. So, you know, you uh, get the language. So that's what we really did. We, I learned Portuguese in the interior after I moved there. But we have to witness. And the witness, you have to be able to speak to the people. A servant and a witness, these things without seeing and the things without appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivery. The Lord takes care of you when you do what God wants you right. to do. And I'll tell you, if I had the time, and I don't this morning, I could tell you some ways the Lord has really taken care of you. I'm meeting somebody think, oh boy, down in the jungle, those big old huge anaconda snakes that live in the river. Some of them get as thick as a, a, a 55 gallon drum. Huge mammoth thing. From here to the door long. Uh, snakes driven that way. Now that must know that isn't the thing that the most dangerous. The piranhas, you've all heard about the piranhas. No, if we swim in the river, there's no problem. They're there, but they don't eat you. You just don't, you know, as long as the scent of blood's there, not there in the river, there's no piranhas, there's no problem. The greatest danger in the land of Brazil, and especially northern Brazil, is get into a Volkswagen taxi with a Brazilian driver. And <laughs> driving that. And that is the danger, the most danger you'll get into in, in the north of Brazil. The snakes and the anacondas and all this thing. Those are there, but they're not dangerous. But those taxi drivers are. And that traffic is dangerous down there. Uh, delivering thee. The Lord takes care of us. And uh, then notice verse 18. The result. My, does a great result for serving and serving. Uh, nothing like it. Opening of eyes. People are blinded, folks. People are not here today in church and they don't know the Lord because they think that what they're out there doing is the thing to do. They're blind. They don't know. And with all of the confusion you have here, and by the way, all the confusion is coming to Brazil too. There's every religion in the world going to the land of Brazil to convert the Brazilians to their religion. They have over 3,000 Mormon missionaries in Brazil alone today. I mean, and it's here too. Error in every direction and every sign. And uh, the reason people are following these things 
They're blind. They can't see. They, 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 don't, they don't see it. They're blinded to the truth. And the only thing that will give them spiritual eyesight is the gospel message. Amen. You can educate them. You can cure them. You can bring their level of living up. You can get them a better home, a better job, a better car, a better anything. But unless they come to know Jesus Christ, they're still blind. Right. Because the gospel is the only thing that can bring spiritual vision. And then turn them from darkness to light. You know, a few years ago, they talked about going to dark Africa as a missionary. And I've heard people in years past saying, well, when I got off the plane in that foreign field, I could just feel uh, the, the, uh, the spirit of darkness. I'll tell you what, folks. You've got everything here in the United States that the world has as far as these religions. And when I hear something I heard on the radio just, the other, just a couple, three days ago, some women, woman prophet out, woman prophetess out in California arrested for prostitution. And she was a pastor of some, I don't know, remember the name of the church. Uh, and the, the news, uh, the little clip in the newscast, uh, just as far out, just as dark as any pagan nation could ever be. That which that woman uh, was defending uh, when she was arrested. Just as dark, just as pagan as any place in the world. Darkness, darkness. But you see, the gospel message brings people from darkness to light. Amen. And whether it's down there in the, what you might call the real pagans, where they still have their witch doctors and all the rest, or whether you be right here in the United States with the same spiritual darkness, just with a different uh, situation. But the gospel brings people from darkness to light. From the power of Satan and the God. Oh yes, you can hear of stories of demon possession on the foreign field and all the rest. But let me tell you folks, it's here too. Right. It's here too. And it's Satan's power. Satan today is, is doing through the New Age movement here in the United States. is bringing in the old paganism from the Hindu religion and all the other uh, paganism around the world. And is making it a popular New Age uh, movement here in the States. You see, uh, this very power of Satan that we used to talk about and say, well, that happens on the foreign field, that happens in Africa, that happens in South America, that happens among these people. But now, uh, no one even blinks when they talk about the church of Satan here in the United States. I mean, you know, uh, Satan is alive and well here in the world, and the uh, Mankind is under his power, and uh, I'm reading a book uh, in the cars. We're traveling around uh, about these different movements, and I'll be frank with you. Uh, what little bit of hair I have, stand on in, just reading about uh, what, how Satan is, is uh, deceiving and, uh, and controlling and completely dominating, and people are allowing, they're going after these things right here in the United States right. of America. But the gospel takes people from the power of Satan unto God. Only the gospel will do this. Receive forgiveness and inheritance, heavenly inheritance, and then down in verse 19, after Paul tells these folks what Christ had told them those many years before, he said, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. God has saved you and I to serve him. He wants to make you and I a servant and a witness for him. That is why he saved us. That's why he is still here. Because you see, if he'd saved us just so you could go to heaven, then as soon as we receive Christ, he'd take us to heaven. No, he's left us here. And the purpose for which he's left us here is that he might make you and I a servant and a witness of him, whether it be here in Lancaster, Ohio, or in Brazil, South America. That's what he wants us to do. And I thank and praise God that the result is a very good result. A tremendous result. The only answer to man's problem is the gospel message. And you and I have this message. We know it. We possess it. And we've been given.